Eustachian tube anatomy. The Eustachian tube is also known as an auditory tube or the pharyngotympanic tube. It connects the nasopharynx to the tympanic cavity. The length of the tube is around 36 millimeters. Directionally, from the tympanic end, it runs downwards, forwards, and medially, forming an angle of 45 degrees with the horizontal. Parts of the tube Eustachian tube has two parts, the fibrocartilaginous and the bony parts. Isthmus is the narrowest area where both parts join. Posterior lateral bony part, which is towards the tympanic cavity, forms one-third of the total length, which is 12 millimeters. Anteromedial fibrocartilaginous part is towards the nasopharynx and forms two-thirds of the tube, which is 24 millimeters. This is made of a single piece of cartilage. It folds upon itself and forms the medial lamina, roof, and a part of the lateral lamina. The rest of the lateral lamina is made of the fibrous membrane, Elastin hinge. It is a part of the Eustachian tube which is rich in elastin fibers and is situated in the roof at the junction of the medial and lateral lamina. When it recoils, it keeps the tube closed when the dilator muscle of Eustachian tube, that is, tensor villi palatini, is not in action. Osmin's pad of fat. It helps in keeping the tube closed. It is lateral in relation to the membranous part of the cartilaginous tube. The closed tube functionally protects itself and middle ear from the reflux of nasal pharyngeal secretions. Openings of the tube Eustachian tube has two openings, one towards the tympanic side and other towards the pharyngeal end. Tympanic opening. This is the bony end and measures 5 by 2 millimeters. It opens at the anterior wall of middle ear, slightly above the middle ear floor. Pharyngeal end. It's a slit-like opening which is situated in the lateral wall of nasopharynx. It's about 1.25 centimeters behind the posterior end of inferior turbinate and is usually closed. On the posterior end, the cartilage produces an elevation known as torus tabaris. Posterior to torus tabaris, there is a depression named the fossa of Rosenmuller, which is a common site for malignancy of nasopharynx. Muscles of Eustachian Tube There are three muscles which are related to the Eustachian tube. They are tensor villi palatini, levator villi palatini, and salpingopharyngeus. Tensor villi palatini muscle The medial fibers of the tensor villi palatini muscle are attached to the lateral lamina of the tube. When there is contraction of the muscle, the tube opens. Levator villi palatini muscle. It runs inferior and parallel to the cartilaginous part of the tube. It forms a bulk under the medial lamina. This muscle, during contraction, pushes the tube upward immediately, thus assisting in opening the tube. Salpingopharyngeus. It is positioned and functions similar to levator villi palatine. It assists in opening the tube. Mucosa of Eustachian tube. Histologically, the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium is interspersed with mucus secreting goblet cells. The submucosa, which is present especially in the cartilaginous part, is rich in ceramucinous glands. The cilia beats in the direction of nasopharynx. The ciliary movements are positioned in such a way that they drain middle ear secretions and fluid into the nasopharynx. An opposite movement is generally avoided. Nerve supply. Tympanic branch of vagus nerve carries sensory and parasympathetic secretomotor fibers to the tubal mucosa. Cranial part of spinal accessory nerve through vagus supplies the levator villi palatini and salpingopharyngeus. Mandibular branch of trigeminal nerve supplies tensor villi palatini and tensor tympani. Differences between infant and adult Eustachian tube. The features of Eustachian tube differ in an infant and adult in various ways. As the Eustachian tube is wider, shorter, and more horizontal in infants, infections from nasopharynx easily reach the middle ear. 
the length ranges between 13 to 18 millimeter at birth, which is about half the size of adult, which is 31 to 38 millimeters, and its average comes around 36 millimeters. When the infants are not fed in head up position, the milk can regurgitate into the middle ear because of this feature. By the age of 7 to 10 years, the tube attains adult morphology and function. The tube is more horizontal with an angle of 10 degrees in an infant. Beyond the age of 7, it forms an angle of 45 degrees with the horizontal. It forms an angulation at the isthmus in adults, whereas in infants, there is no angulation. Eustachian tube consists of bony and cartilaginous parts. In infants, the bony part is slightly longer than one-third of the total length of the cartilaginous one and is more wider. In adults, we find that the bony part is one-third and cartilaginous is two-thirds. The tubal cartilage is flaccid in infants due to which retrograde reflux of nasopharyngeal secretions are frequently encountered whereas in adults, it's rigid and remain closed, protecting reflux to the middle ear. The recoil capacity of the tube is determined by the density of elastin present at the hinge. The elastin is less dense in infants, due to which the efficiency of recoil is reduced, and tube doesn't close properly. As the density of elastin is more in adults, it helps to keep the tube closed by recoil of the cartilage. Osmin's pad of fat is less in volume in infants and large in adults, which keeps the tube closed. That's all for the video. We'll see you next time.